Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's masterclass, part of the Aon Insights series. The theme of our discussion today is managing credit risk in a volatile and unpredictable world. My name's Dan Chapman. I run the credit solutions business for Aon here in Australia, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Hugh Burke, CoFast's Chief Commercial Officer for the APAC region. Hugh, thanks so much for joining us. Did you want to start by giving us an intro into CoFAS? Yeah, sure, Dan. Thank you. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invite. Um, COFAS is one of the world's largest credit insurers. We have around 1.7 billion of US dollars in revenues. We have over 4,000 employees in 100 countries around the world, and we underwrite about 650 billion US dollars of credit risk at any one time across 200 countries. Thanks, Hugh. As the title suggests, and as we all know, we're operating in a volatile environment where credit risk has never been higher. If we start by looking back to 2019, credit risk was already on the rise. We had a slowing global economy, escalating trade wars between the US and China, and Brexit continuing to grab the headlines in Europe. Fast forward and COVID emerges as a global threat. Over the past nine months, COVID has caused tragic human loss, but it's also had a devastating impact on our economy. Supply chain disruption, and market volatility have continued to constrict cash flows for businesses all around the world. It resulted in some high profile insolvencies, and these are set to become an everyday occurrence in Australia as we move into 2021. Managing credit risk has never been, but assessment of credit risk has arguably never been harder. Hugh, can you give us some insights into Covas's view of the global economy? Yeah, sure, Dan. Thank you. As you know, and as you just mentioned, today's world operates as a rapidly changing credit risk environment. We are experiencing the sharpest GDP decline since the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. The sharpest declines are being seen in Europe, North America, and some of the emerging markets here in Asia, like Indonesia and the Philippines. There's definitely a differential perform differentiated performance sorry, when it comes to trade, with both China and Thailand already back in positive trading territory. But globally, we expect a 4.4% decrease in GDP this year, um, followed by a bounce back in, in 2021 to around 5.1% GDP for, um, is what we forecasted. We do need to caveat this somewhat, though. This prediction obviously needs to remain fluid. We don't know if we're going to see a fully-fledged second global outbreak of, of COVID and, and more lockdowns as the colder weather enters into Europe and the US. And if that does happen, obviously, there's little doubt that any recovery is going to naturally be impacted by this. Yeah, thanks, Hugh. Look, I certainly hope that the, the recovery in 2021 is as steep as the chart suggests. As you say, there's plenty of positives with economies starting to open up. But but I think you're right when you say that, that there's a lot of risks associated with this. And um, very quickly, this could turn around if there's second or even third waves of COVID, which lead to the reintroduction of options around the world. If we move on to the next slide, um, this is actually a COFAS graphic, but um, I've been stealing it for some, some presentations recently, so I hope you don't mind. Um, I really <clears> like <throat> this slide because I think it, it really tells the story of how COVID doesn't have a uniform impact across the world. Some countries are much more impacted than others. Do you, do you want to give us some insight into why you think some countries are being significantly more impacted? Yeah, sure. First of all, I'm glad you like it. I also I think it's a great slide. It, it gives us a, a real macro view on both a regional and country basis. It shows a real story of resilience across Asia, for instance, with the exception of maybe Hong Kong, where social and political tension since the middle of last year has had a real significant impact on the local economy here. COFAS is predicting that global insolvencies will increase by 33% in the coming 12 months, with Hong Kong and Australia being the only two countries in the Asia-Pacific region who are expected to exceed this number. If I put this into context, though, the, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, so ASIC, as you know it, reported 7,500 insolvencies in Australia for the 2018-19 financial year. So we're expecting that number to increase by 50% over the next um, 12 months. However, we do know from our own data that despite being below many other countries around the world, insolvencies across Asia Pacific are on the increase when compared to the last two or three years. Japan's a really good example here of a country with very little historic insolvencies. And we expect to see that number increase by 24% in the next 12 months. So there's definitely trouble ahead or uncertainty ahead is probably a better way of putting it. Yeah, thanks, Hugh. And look, you, you touched on Australia briefly 
there and it does really stand out on that graphic as being quite considerably above the the global average um, i mean that's interesting anyway but it's even more so when you consider there's we've actually seen a drop of insolvencies this year now obviously that's a direct result of the changes in insolvency law that were brought in as a result of COVID. but with these recently being extended out to, to December, I think um, it really is the quiet before the storm. And I think there's a, there's a lot of, of bad news and, and risk to, to follow in, in the next few months. Um, if we just go back to Australia, why do you think that Australia is going to be so impacted relative to some of our neighbours? Yeah, look, if we look at the Australian economy in isolation, it was already hit hard with the bushfires last summer and then COVID came in, in the first quarter or, or early second quarter of this year. So what we've seen is we've seen the Aust Australia's GDP contract by 6.3% by year on year. But if we look at it on a quarterly, quarter by quarter basis, Q2's GDP reduced by 7% when, when compared to Q1. The IMF, the International, International Monetary Fund, started compiling GDP stats in 1980, and we expect Australia to record the worst ever GDP um, statistic in 2020. If, if you look at Victoria, the, the, the state itself contributes 23% to the country's GDP. Hopefully, uh, the current lockdown measures will be relieved over the coming weeks, but there's no doubt that the past three or four months will have a real negative impact on the economy, the Australian economy, in, in the second half of this year. In addition to that, the unemployment rate has increased to 7.5% in July, and it's expected to jump to around 10%, according to the Reserve Bank of Australia. Um, there's also an international travel ban. <laughs> Tourism accounts for 10% of Australia's GDP. We don't know when the travel ban will be lifted. It'll be at some point we expect in 2021. Uh, and to top all of that off, you've got worsening relations with China and Australia, Australia's largest export market. A good example here is a of a deterioration with China is the introduction of an 80% import tariff on Australian barley in May. However, there is some good news, Dan. Um, we expect to see a bounce back in 2021 for the Australian market and GDP. We don't expect it to be much higher in 2019, so we expect it to bounce back to 2019 levels. Thanks, Hugh. Look, you're right, it's been a difficult 12 months and there's certainly some significant challenges ahead for Australia. Um, we've discussed the, the fact that the impact of COVID isn't uniform across countries, but, but the same is true, obviously, across sectors as well. We're expecting to see a lot of uh, insolvencies in those industries that are directly impacted by the restrictions, such as um, leisure, travel and retail, or well, certainly retail, which doesn't have a significant online presence. We're already seeing uh, our clients report a significant jump in overdues in these sectors, but, but we are seeing that across the board. And I, I think it's fair to say that risk has increased across the board. With many businesses indirectly impacted by the economic conditions, which which industries, other than the ones I've mentioned, do you expect to, to see struggle in the next 12 months and which ones are going to be the least impacted? I agree. We're, we're, seeing, we're seeing stress in many industries, both on a global and also on, on a regional basis here in, region, in, in Asia Pacific. The, this chart here, you'll see, Dan, the orange ring in this chart shows the industries that have been hardest hit since the beginning of COVID from, with regards to an increase in their net debt and also reduced revenues. The automotive sector jumps out. It's no real surprise. It's been well publicised that the downturn in, in the automotive sector has seen car manufacturers slowing or even stopping production. And, and the various worldwide lockdowns impacted new car sales in, in 2020. From our, from our perspective, we have obviously clients in the sector and we've seen it, it, their turnover um, reduced by around 70% this year. Certain industries are showing evidence of resilience. Pharmaceuticals, you would expect that uh, with the COVID-19 and, and the focus on, on chasing for the the, the, um, the vaccine, and pharmace the pharmaceutical industry is doing, doing well, but also ICT. If we look at the ICT sector, more and more people are working from home these days. Companies have upgraded their, their infrastructure to allow a more seamless um, working from home environment. And, and also households themselves are upgrading their laptops and their tablets. Uh, and But the question we've got here is how long will this last for? There's only so many tablets and, and laptops you can buy for your household. So, so we do suspect and, and we, we, we have a suspicion that there will be stress to come in this, uh, in this sector um, in the coming, coming months or years ahead. 
Yeah, thanks, Hugh. I, I know I've certainly done my bit for the ICT sector in recent months. Um, obviously, look, it's really useful to be able to identify the risk sectors, but there's few businesses that can actually pivot overnight. If you're a, an automotive parts manufacturer, then to stop selling to the automotive industry isn't, isn't going to be very easy. There's always strong buyers in weak sectors and vice versa. So I guess the real challenge for businesses is being able to ascertain which is which. Obviously, as you know, trade credit insurance acts as a safety net to protect businesses in the event of a loss. But I think it's, it's just as important that it helps businesses avoid the loss altogether. Obviously, clients look to, to leverage the information that uh, credit insurers hold and use that information to steer them away from the poor risks and towards the higher risks. And, and in doing that, I guess, give them the, the confidence to increase sales in what is a very difficult economic backdrop. Is it possible for you to give us a bit of an understanding of the information that, that COFAS uses and uh, to evaluate this credit risk? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, information is at the core of what we do. As a business, we invest over 150 million US dollars a year on data gathering alone. This helps us take a holistic view on the environment, trade sectors, economies and individual companies themselves. We cannot rely solely, as you know, on historical snapshot information like balance sheets and profit and loss accounts. As you know, Dan, they can be nearly one year old by the time they're actually filed with ASIC. It's therefore really important that we understand current trading trends, we review public information like press and online data, and to help improve our own insights. In addition to the data sources we review, it's useful to mention that we conduct surveys, and in particular, our Asia-Pacific Asia payment survey, which gives us further insight to trading patterns of both countries and trade sectors. For example, 65% of companies surveyed in Asia-Pacific experienced payment delays in 2019. This was obviously pre-COVID-19, so we can expect a further deterioration to, to be reported when the new survey is re re released. Um, incidentally, this was um, this was actually higher for Australian companies at 67%. So in general, the companies surveyed had experienced payment delays of 85 days, with the longest payment delays being experienced in China, Malaysia and Singapore. From a sector perspective, the worst affected sectors for delays in payment were construction, ICT and energy, which again are all pivotal um, trade sectors for the Australian economy. So to sum up, Dan, I agree with everything you've just said. Trade credit is an extremely important risk management tool, never more so than in today's world. Remember, it gives access to the types of information um, that we have and we study. Um, it helps companies understand their receivable portfolio. It enables them to be informed and analytical when making decisions around the, reliab the reliability of both their existing and new business partners. Thanks, you. Obviously, couldn't agree more. Um, Thanks again for, for your time today. It's been really good to, to have uh, insights into to COFAS and, and the information that you use to, to make credit decisions and help clients. Um, I hope everyone listening found it valuable. I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you.